Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. The new one Vanderbilt office tower nearing completion in New York City makes a grand gesture towards its neighbor Grand Central Terminal by effectively cutting a wedge from its base to allow more openness to the new pedestrian mall between and more views of the side of Grand Central Terminal. This is noble, but it also reminds me of a tree notched before it is felled. One Vanderbilt is the new 1,402 foot tall tower going up just west of Grand Central Terminal. As of this critique, it is open, but not quite finished, many months behind schedule. I think it's fair to make a critique anyway because so much of it is built and there's so much virtual imagery that one can certainly see what the architects intended to build. Alfred Hitchcock once said that before he began shooting a film, he had every scene blocked every camera angle set, and every cut made in his head. The creativity was done, the rest was just work. I think for architects, that's often the case. At this stage of the game, the entire building has been designed and the rest is just manual labor to finish construction. Architects Cohn Penderson Fox Associates, KPF, are a very competent and prolific firm with some of the tallest towers going up all around the world. One Vanderbilt being developed by S.L. Green Realty Corp. Green is in the name, so they must be environmentally friendly. Is really a boring program for a building. Build a big office tower next to Grand Central Terminal. So the challenge was to take a boring program and make it interesting. Jamie Von Klemperer of KPF said that their design does so by coming to a delicate point in the sky, like the Empire State and the Chrysler buildings. This is a reference to the 100 foot tall needle spire at the top, which frankly appears to be stuck on rather than emerging from the tapering tower form. If only creating skyline interest were that easy. A skyline filled with the same profiles at the same super tall heights eventually becomes routine. I think developers realize that they are adding undistinguished buildings to the New York City skyline because they use their address as their names. One Vanderbilt, 111 West 57th, 220 Central Park South. No one is christening the buildings with names like the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, the AT&T Building, or Rockefeller Center. This is perhaps so non-New Yorkers can find them. The Vanderbilt Street was named for the Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, who built a shipping and train empire that fed the economy that created the wealth that made New York City one of the greatest cities ever to exist. So perhaps boldly calling the building the Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt Building was going to be met with woke resistance, and so an address, one Vanderbilt, was sufficiently pusillanimous. There is nothing really wrong with one Vanderbilt. KPF has executed a noble building adhering to basic architectural principles. The building will not fall down. It will comfortably house the people on the inside. It is not ugly. Like their towers at Hudson Yards, Architecture Codex number four, the slightly narrowing shaft is a statement of stability that goes back to ancient Egyptian obelisks. Overtly articulated or decorated towers are the current trend in the search for skyline identity. Perhaps that is why 432 Park Avenue, Architecture Codex number 12, stood out to me in spite of its bland name because of its purest modernist geometry. And so I guess it is a blessing that such a well-executed building by the likes of KPF are becoming mundane. If KPF had instead designed some overtly grotesque decorated tower, 
I might be vehemently aghast. Instead, I am pleased if not smitten, perhaps like a couple that has been married for 60 years having romance. But what is irksome is the public relations environmental virtual signaling the developers are pushing. I've been into responsible design for 40 years and I got my lead accreditation in 2003. So I realized that 95% of what the public reads about sustainable design is fluff. There is no way to build a 1400 foot tall building without having impact on the environment. Every day, everybody has impact on the environment. That's because left to its own devices, the environment will kill us. It has been killing humans for millions of years, whether by volcano, drought, wild animals, or extreme cold weather. And yet, humankind has survived in every climate on the face of the earth using sticks, stones, animal skins, and animal bones. We eventually developed other technologies and built cities, some with aqueducts and sewers. And therefore, the entire history of humankind has been reliant upon sustainable technologies that allow us to live and allow us to progress. Occasionally, we make errors that have deleterious effects, or just plain ignorance of the science has led to disaster. But we usually figure it out, find a way to correct it, and move forward. Being good stewards of the earth doesn't mean we have to worship it like a god the way our ancestors once did. The information about one Vanderbilt's green building efforts reveal them to be as mundane as the building design. And by the way, that is a compliment. The buildings are doing the necessary but now routine things that are geared towards sustainable construction. High recycled content in the building materials low VOC, volatile organic compounds in the paints and coatings, sorting and recycling construction waste are commonplace because the construction industry has slowly moved to these technologies and practices. Vanderbilt's rainwater reclamation system will handle 90,000 gallons. Great. What that really means is their drain pipes will collect the water and use it in a gray water system. Again, not uncommon on current eco-friendly buildings. One Vanderbilt brags about their use of an air system that uses the moderate temperature of outside air during certain seasons to either cool or heat the inside of the building. These are called economizer cycles and have been around for over 40 years. They describe the fluted terracotta panels as earthware. Ooh, earth. That's good, right? What they really mean is they're made of clay. There's a description of a 1.2 megawatt cogeneration, and yet they never identify what is the source of that power. Is this just fancy wording for a gas-fired electric backup generator? They even tout the use of a material described as, quote, carbon fixing, organically renewable from sustainable managed forests unquote, when they could have just used the word wood. To be clear, I am criticizing the public relations and not the building itself or the designers or the builders. They are trying to buzz a population that orgasms to things like solar panels, but yawns if you mention how efficient your spiral scrolled variable speed compressors are. All these environmentally sensitive building techniques are a testament to the success of an industry that has been trying to build better for the last 50 years. And what were once outlandish standards, our values for insulation are now building code. But the spin doctors are trying to virtual signal about things they don't understand, technologies that make their head spin. If only we could harvest that spinning mechanical energy. Ground level is where one Vanderbilt really distinguishes itself as superior. The building recognizes the majesty of Grand Central Terminal, so the facade of Vanderbilt opens up at the base with an angular form that allows greater appreciation of the landmark train station. 
While I liken this to the wedge cut from a tree about to be felled, the building design by structural engineers Severod Associates, who also did the structure for the Gateway Arch, will not fall down. The developers demonstrate their good neighbor status by cooperating with the transit system to help expand the access and footprint of the terminal, which links commuter trains with subway system and the New York City streetscape. Once again, KPF's subtlety might be lost on the average pedestrian, who will experience the excitement of the spaces manifest without appreciating the thoughtful design that created it. What makes one Vanderbilt truly great is that it follows the first three laws of real estate. Location, location, location. It is next to Grand Central Terminal, which remains the premier historical transportation hub in New York City. Concentrating office space near Grand Central has always been part of the original concept. And in this way, it will permit those New Yorkers who still go to work to continue to lie about how their commute is less than 30 minutes. Thus, a modest 74-story tower here, contrived by complex air rights laws and a little spot zoning by the great friend of the real estate developers, Mayor de Blasio, makes sense, whereas most of the tallest buildings built around the world are vanity edifices constructed for the bragging rights and consequently are more negative on their environments. Ironically, the developers may have invested in de Blasio's mayalty thinking it would reap financial benefits, but they may not have counted on him ruining New York City so quickly. One well-executed building cannot stop political destruction. New York City was once the home to manufacturing, creating real things. It was also a stop on the water route from the Great Lakes across the Erie Canal down the Hudson River on the way to the Atlantic Ocean. But manufacturing left New York City and the USA a long time ago. The Erie Canal was replaced by the St. Lawrence Seaway, and New York's commercial port is now in Elizabeth, New Jersey. All that is left in New York City are the talking heads in media, fashion, and Wall Street. Frankly, New York City is a company town, and that company is Wall Street, which drives the economy of the greater metropolitan area. When Wall Street figures out that they do not need to be in New York City, New York City dies. And if leadership continues their hostility towards the revenue makers, they will drive out all the people who made New York City great, people like Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. We will still have tourism and Broadway, but our current leadership is also hostile to the peacemakers, the people who changed the rough streets of the 1970s into the economically vibrant and safe streets that we have seen in the last few decades. Tourism will only return when tourists deem that it is safe to come to New York City. Otherwise, Without economic vitality and safety, New York City may become a hollow metropolis whose only hope is to become a large, urban, 20th century version of Williamsburg, Virginia, where residents are required to don mid-century modern clothing in order to entertain the visitors. I am Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.